I always, every year, like to touch base with Mitch Resnick and, and say, Mitch, what's new with Scratch? What are you guys doing? And so on. And uh, make us smart. And so we're really grateful that for the second time, he's let us uh, hear from one of his, his best and brightest over at the Media Lab. It's Eric Rosenbaum. So Eric's going to talk about the third wave in children's technology, and, and the basic premise was, what would Papert be saying right now? Seymour Papert, of course, of the author of Mindstorms, if uh, if he were here and about the uh, uh, with the iPad. So that was sort of the basic premise, right? Well, that sounded like a, um, a really interesting talk, but kind of difficult to figure out what Pepper would say. Um, so I decided to do something a little different from that. Isn't that a surprise? <laughs> um, Eric Rosenbaum. Thanks. Yeah, so there is some Pepper in there, but um, a few other interesting surprises uh, that hopefully you will enjoy. Uh, so I'm, I'm Eric. Uh, like Warren said, I'm a... Shh, thank you. I'm a, oh, I'm a graduate student at uh, MIT at the Media Lab working on my PhD with Mitch Resnick. Um, we have a lot of fun there, uh, as I hope you'll get a sense of. Um, so this idea of the third wave, um, I thought I would try to zoom out and talk about uh, the big picture. It's a chance for me to sort of uh, learn from the history a little bit. I realized actually coming in here that it's a little crazy for me to try to talk about the historical picture and the big ideas in a room full of people like you guys, but hopefully I'll have something uh, that's interesting to you and maybe a little provocative. Uh, and then the other part of the talk that um, comes at the end is, is what we want the future of computing to look like. And I'm uh, going to ask you to actually take that seriously and say, uh, what do we really want? Not what new ideas come out of technology, but uh, you know, what do we think in terms of, of human development and what we really want for, for our kids? Um, Oh, I should say also one caveat about my kind of big picture ideas and historical perspective is that obviously uh, it's going to be a little bit MIT-centric, so you might take issue with how I frame things, but I'm pretty indoctrinated coming from where I come from. Um, so uh, here's my kind of big picture that um, technology for children has been influenced by these, these two big waves so far, the personal computing in the 80s and then the internet, of course. And so I'll talk about um, how I think uh, we can draw some, some ideas from those. And then uh, the question is, uh, are we entering a third wave of something that's just as influential and powerful on children's technology as those first two? And if we are, uh, what is that thing? So you can think about that. And then I'll tell you one idea that I have. Um, so of course, the first wave uh, is personal computing. Uh, and in particular, uh, kids' involvement with it. So this, um, I think this is a pretty interesting picture um, because, well, here's my question. When, uh, if you aren't familiar with this, some, some of you have probably seen it, uh, what do you think is the, the earliest somebody could have conceptualized this? Kids sitting in the grass with their, uh, what look like tablet computers. <laughs> what year? <laughs> nice. So this, 1968? Wow, that would have been impressive. Actually, Alan Kay drew this in 1972, and I think that's pretty impressive. Um, so, <laughs> you were close, that was pretty good. Um, a lot of amazing stuff happened back then. Um, and uh, many things were, were invented that we now take for, for granted um, at that time. So uh, Alan Kay, if you don't know who that is, is this uh, computer scientist who um, he actually uh, invented some pretty cool stuff all the way back then. You might be familiar with the idea of a gra graphical user interface that has windows that can actually overlap with each other. He was the first one to do that, and um, you may have heard of object-oriented programming. Uh, that's him. Pretty cool. Um, and so he had this vision all the way back then of what he called the Dynabook. So uh, it's, it's worth talking about what his vision looked like, because he predicted a lot of things really accurately. If you go back and look at this 1972 paper, uh, you can find it online. He talked in a lot of detail about what this beautiful, ideal children's machine would look like uh, in terms of the technology of the day. And it looked a lot like the iPad, but not exactly. Um, so you can see in this description of it that he's talking about it being really personal. 1972, people didn't use computers in the woods, but that's what he knew that we, that we were ultimately going to want, that it would be portable, 
um, superior to books in printing, at least in some ways, without being markedly inferior in others. Um, but that first part of the quote, up at the top, I think is really interesting and powerful, and something that we can still uh, maybe strive for. So um, what does this mean? Uh, it's a little, a little heavy. A medium for containing and expressing arbitrary symbolic notions, and also a collection of useful tools for manipulating these structures with ways to add new tools to the repertoire. So what he's talking about here is a belief in the power of this sort of infinite flexibility uh, of, of computers. And I think it's something that, uh, to some degree, we've, we've lost a little bit. I think software developers have a sense of this power uh, when they create things, but we're not sufficiently uh, handing it over to children. Um, so that was, that, that's an early vision of what computing for kids could look like. Um, when he talks about adding new tools to the repertoire, he definitely didn't mean uh, buying new apps from the App Store. He meant something pretty different from that. Um, so <clears throat> I've actually had the chance to interact with Alan Kay, very interesting guy. Uh, and so I got the chance to ask him, uh, is the iPad the Dynabook? Um, and uh, here's what he wrote in the email. What is really weak, and artificially so, is the service conception of the iPad as an automated media consumption device, rather than as a gateway and environment for exploring powerful ideas by building them on the grand side, and for simply allowing end users to make their own. Uh, this is both bad and stupid and actually retrograde on Apple's part. He doesn't mince words here. Uh, it's a bike with too many training wheels and done well enough so most people would not realize it has training wheels. It distorts what a bike actually is. So he's saying that there's, there's more to computing than what we're giving the kids. Um, so that's an early, early vision of what personal computing could be. Um, and of course, uh, I want to talk about Seymour Papert's ideas a little bit. Um, I'm curious, actually, I could talk a little bit about Logo, but most of you are probably familiar with it. Who's written a Logo program? Most people have actually written Logo, logo code. That's great, but not everybody. So if you haven't, this was um, uh, invented um, at MIT by people including Seymour Papert, and it was came from this idea that um, educators were starting to say in the early days of computing that we could have computers program children, um, but why not have children program the computers? It was a crazy idea at the time. And so he invented this way for kids to explore this world of, of um, graphics on the screen and, and do geometry by issuing commands to a little turtle that could move around. Um, and it was really about um, tinkering and exploration. Um, and so uh, the the bigger picture of this is not that it's about like teaching geometry, but it's about uh, creating uh, ideas and new artifacts that are personally meaningful and allowing kids to sort of pursue their own interests and make what they wanted to make. Um, actually, I'm going to mention constructionism here because it came up earlier, and I'll give my own description of it. So, um, what's what Papert was doing, uh, of course, comes out of Piaget's ideas about constructivism. So. Uh, the word with the V about sort of building knowledge in your head. And the word with the N, constructionism, is about um, making, <coughs> making things in the world. So not just building ideas in your head, but doing that by creating artifacts that have some personal and maybe social uh, meaning. So I wanted to include this quote from uh, Papert's book, Mindstorms, which talks about uh, the impending logo revolution. Um, unclear whether that really happened, but the, the vision is a really beautiful one. Um, so computers as these space age objects that will enter the private worlds of children everywhere. And we know that that's happening now, but he was writing this, oh, what year was Mindstorms? Early 80s, I think. Anybody know? Around the time that I was born. Um, oh. So, sorry. Gratuitous. <laughs> Yo, whippersnapper! <laughs> Get off my lawn. <laughs> um, so, it's just worth pointing out that the book and the vision that Seymour was talking about is much bigger than Logo and kids programming computers. It's first of all about powerful ideas, about these really generative concepts that kids can stumble into and, in some sense, build on their own. So they're geometric ideas, but 
In the world of Logo, ideas like procedural encapsulation, modularity, feedback, recursion, recursion these, are, these are big ideas. And he thought that we could build environments like Logo, other micro-worlds, that could allow children to stumble into and create uh, other powerful ideas on their own. And that these could be the seeds of cultural change. So it's this larger vision and allow people to um, form a new relationship with knowledge, cutting across um, the sciences and the humanities. That's pretty forward thinking. And even get into knowledge of the self, um, which is, I think, um, a powerful thing that's, that's still relevant today that we can still work on. Um, so um, some enduring ideas from the first wave, especially coming from Papert, are that uh, we learn by creating uh, and building on our own interests, and that that's what we should use personal computing for kids to do. Um, so on to uh, the second wave. So still being MIT-centric here, uh, obviously the internet has been really powerful in children's technology, um, and especially for doing collaborative, online, creative um, uh, stuff. And so the lens that I have on that is through a project called Scratch. Okay, I asked about Logo. Who's written a Scratch program? Probably fewer of you. But, but a lot of people, wow, <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, a lot of people, I guess, are, are familiar with Scratch, but if you're not, it's a uh, it's continuing in the tradition of Logo, of a programming environment uh, for children, but it's really about, about media now. Uh, so you can use your own uh, artwork and graphics and animations. You can bring in your own um, sounds and audio and create a huge variety of things, uh, interactive art and animated stories and games. Uh, and it's this programming environment that uses these graphical blocks like Legos that snap together um, so that uh, you actually can't make syntactic errors. So we're trying to remove some of the frustration of programming. And the other important piece of it, of course, um, you can see on the other side there is this um, website that we have for kids to share their projects. Uh, and that's been a really powerful thing. We launched Scratch. Um, about four years ago, and now there's uh, almost two million projects that kids have created that are on the site, uh, which is pretty exciting. Um, one of the things that we're seeing happening is this phenomenon of remixing. So um, kids post their projects on the site, you can see and interact with them, but also every project uh, you can download uh, and modify and then upload your own, own modified version of it to the site. Uh, and then it, it shows up with the remix um, history. So in this case, it's uh, a kid has, has used this little lizard character chasing a ice cream truck and said, add your own character to the scene. So they've come up with their own ways of encouraging remixing that we didn't anticipate. Uh, and we were able to show the kind of uh, trees, the history of how remixing is happening. Um, and that's been interesting as a, a research topic. Um, another form of, of collaboration that we're seeing with Scratch are these companies. And this was pretty cool. We didn't anticipate this either. Um, in the early days, a group of kids forms uh, calling themselves Gray Bear Productions. Uh, and they decided that they were going to be a game company. Uh, and they would divide up tasks. They're actually distributed all over the world. I think one of the kids is in Australia, one in England, and one on the east coast of the US. Um, and then they grew and grew. And they divided up into doing things like, uh, you know, I'll be the animator. Uh, you're the programmer, I'll work on the storyline and the art. Uh, and you can see here some of the, the games that they've worked on over time. And then this model got um, mimicked by other kids. They really love uh, thinking of themselves in the role of the game developers whose games they normally play. And they want to do things like launch uh, trailers and previews for other kids to get them excited. Um, so that's been a powerful new uh, form of collaboration that we're seeing. And I should mention we're working on um, Scratch 2.0. The next version, and one of the things that we're really pushing hard on is uh, helping kids collaborate in these ways. We really didn't design around this form of collaboration in the first version, uh, so we're hoping to, to create a lot more of that um, for the future. Okay, so so far we've seen some ideas about personal computing and then about the internet as those affect um, computing for kids. So what what comes next? Uh, how am I doing for time? Keep plowing. Keep going. All right. It's only been 14 minutes. Yeah, only been 14 minutes. About halfway. Okay, cool. Um, I love more cool stuff. Um, so what's this third wave? Uh, you probably have some ideas. Um, here's one idea, uh, which maybe you weren't thinking of. It's, it's not as obvious. So technology that engages your body and the world. So I'm really talking about how there's this problem that it's very easy for our 
devices to create a focus on themselves and technology in general to refer to itself. And so we should push back against that, I think, and try to make things that uh, bring the focus back out onto you and onto the world around you. And so we're seeing that with things like the Wii and the Kinect that engage your body, and even, I think, uh, things like gestural computing as a way to make your interaction much more intimate, like we see with the iPad, is part of that. Um, but I want to talk about uh, some of the other projects um, that are going on uh, in the research group that I'm part of that I think bring out these ideas in some new ways. Um, so, I think I have time to show all of them. Um, I'll talk about something called Color Code, which is a, a new modification to Scratch, a draw audio of singing fingers. Actually, I don't have a glow doodle demo, but you might have seen that at a previous Duster Magic. That's a, uh, a light painting system that allows you to sort of explore the objects in your world and use basically anything that glows or even reflects light well as a paintbrush. So it's about using uh, the materials around you in a new way. Okay, so um, now I get to demo singing fingers. Um, this should be fun. So, I want to try to get the, this camera up there, if we can, and I'll show you. Now, um, so this is a, an iPad app that, um, that I developed in collaboration with another one of the students at the lab. And, um, I'm in here, okay. Yep. It's about finger painting with sound to adjust things so that you can see it well. <coughs> so there are the singing fingers. Um, thanks. Cool. There are the singing fingers. Um, thanks. Cool. So the idea is, if you haven't seen this already, um, draw on the screen and make a sound at the same time. So it's like this. And then you can touch your drawing to play the sound back. Does that come out? Uh, you can also uh, talk into it. Singing fingers. Singing fingers. Singing fingers. Um, so that's pretty fun. Um, thank you. There's more. Um, so uh, you may have noticed that there's different colors. So I actually use a pitch tracking algorithm to map um, uh, pitch onto colors. So if I sing a scale, I'll actually get uh, a rainbow. And now I actually have a little instrument that I can play. You want to hear the multi-touch part too? I was a little out of tune, but you get the idea. <laughs> um, so I, I want to just play around here and show you that it's not just about vocal sounds. You can record any sounds and, and make a drawing of them. So I'll invite Colombo up to help me out here. Um, I don't know, just jam out and draw with it. So we know each other, yes. <laughs> He's a good guy. Um, so let's see. I'm soaking up my time here. So I want to I want to show you uh, a video. Is that available? Oh, yes. glad you asked. Um, it's uh, it's free today and all the time. <laughs> I give it away. Um, so uh, yeah, just search for Singing Fingers. There's an iPhone version. Uh, the iPad version came out more recently and works uh, way better because the pitch tracking and sound synthesis are uh, the results of a lot more work. Um, so give it a try. Back on here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'll just show you a short. I'll just show you a short video that gives you. Some 
space. Is that on YouTube? It's, uh, it's on YouTube, it's on Vimeo, it's everywhere, but just go to singingfingers.com and you can see it there. Um, okay, so... Uh, now, the next thing in the same vein of trying to bring the interactivity out into the world and get people exploring is this new thing we're calling color code. Um, we haven't even shown this to very many people, it's brand new. I actually just made this video a few days ago, uh, so it's still in the works, but I'd love to hear what you think about it. So this is, um, comes as a new feature for Scratch that we're hoping to add for the, the, the next version. And the idea is to use computer vision techniques to allow kids to create their own augmented reality experiences uh, by using the colors of everyday objects in the world. So like here in, in the still, and then you'll see in the video, uh, I'm holding up Cookie Monster, a little plush toy, and on the screen, this is the, the Scratch environment where we've programmed these little cookies to move around. And uh, we've set it up so that Scratch is sensing the blue color of Cookie Monster, and then the cookies can tell if they're touching that blue. Everything else is black and white. And so we just sense the blue, uh, and you can probably guess what happens uh, when they touch. Um, hopefully this video will work okay. So now I can use anything else that's blue. So that's, a, that's actually a bottle of paint. It's one of our uh, little advertising cards for Scratch. And if I hang that from my necklace, I have a whole different kind of game that I created just by using the, the physical materials around me in a new way. Um, so here we're, we're playing with uh, autumn leaves and sensing their colors. In order to make uh, basically a platform game, where the platforms are moved, being moved physically by people's hands. Uh, the little jetpack girl is being moved by the keyboard, and then there's that target, which is actually a bouncy ball. Uh, here we are using some uh, M&Ms to make an edible sequencer. So the, each color of an M&M represents a drum sound, we move them around in time, and then the Scratch project uh, plays back the sounds. So, get off my lawn! I know. <laughs> <laughs> this is the new stuff, Warren. Um, this is what kids are going to be doing in the future. Uh, so, of course, it's not just about those examples. It's about kids creating their own things like that, using the power of the Scratch programming environment and extending that out uh, into the to the physical world. Um, okay, so. One more example. This one's a little crazier. It's not an app, it's not on the computer, but it does this thing of engaging you with exploring the materials around you. Anybody familiar with Draudio already? Yeah. Nice. Nice. <laughs> um, so, let's see what happens here. <laughs> So it starts out as a musical pencil. You can draw your own musical instruments. <laughs> but 
But it's much more than that. We can take the circuit right off of the pencil and put it onto a paintbrush. Same technology, same device. <laughs> and what if we take it off of there and put it onto literally the kitchen sink? Now we can play music on the stream of water. I know that uh, Darren's, Darren has struggled with, uh, with his sons uh, with potty training. Uh, and I'm just seeing a, an app there, maybe. Or, uh, uh, maybe in uh, you know, airport restrooms there could be sort of a, turn, turn that row into an orchestra. There's actually a guy at the Media Lab years ago that a project called uh, You're in Control. <laughs> And, and um, you're in trouble, so yeah. we'll Okay, so I'm almost out of time here, but I, um, I want to get back to the what do we want part of the talk. So I left this for the end because uh, it's about these sort of deeper ideas, trying to rise above these waves of technological change and say, you know, these are things that have been there from, for, from the beginning and they're, they still represent big challenges. Um, when we talk about engagement, at least when I say that, I mean something bigger than getting focused on what's, what's right in front of you. I mean real deep in engagement, pursuing things that you're passionate about. So if you think about like your own path through life, what got you involved in children's technology? Why are you pursuing that now? What, what factors allowed you to take that path? Um, that's the kind of engagement I'm talking about, pursuing your passions. Um, and so sometimes I worry if the trend towards apps is towards bite-sized experiences, which don't allow people to go deeply, go deep in that way. Um, so I think we should push in that direction. Even harder is, uh, is empathy. Um, so this is clearly something we need more of in the world, helping people understand each other's perspectives. Um, and the role of technology here is actually not clear. Um, there have been some hints at, at it, um, even here at this conference, of people doing really interesting stuff. But I think if we're honest with ourselves and ask, for example, do current sort of paradigms about using technology for social networking actually address our ability to understand each other in this deep way? Uh, well, that's a hard question, um, but worth asking. And then the last thing is um, empowerment. And I mean something different from the way other people have used that term here, I think. Um, it's, I mean, not just that you know I can do it, meaning I did what somebody else set out for me, but that I can do something that I choose, that I can uh, find autonomy, I can discover my identity, um, things like that. So the bigger sense of empowerment is really important. So I want to leave you, again, return to Papert and leave with this quote uh, about the kind of challenge that, that he was posing, about how to think about education, education in the larger sense, and how computers affect that. Um, so there's this, there's always been this divide, and there will continue to be, about um, sort of what kind of people do we want uh, to create in the world? Do we want uh, people who are good at following instructions and doing things uh, that are set up for them by others, or do we want empowered people who can make their own decisions and shape their own lives? Uh, so that's that's the end. Uh, thanks. <laughs>